For over 100 years, Iowa State University Extension and Outreach has been serving Iowans. As our state recovers from COVID-19, we will continue to deliver information and education based on research to help you care for your family, manage stress, and support your community, your business, and your farm. We're here for you now, and we will be for the next 100 years. Together, we will build a strong Iowa. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our tips from an expert, gardening for beginners. I am Leah Feltz. I am not your gardening expert. I am the social media specialist for Extension and Outreach. Um, I'd like to introduce today's expert, Cindy Haynes. Hello. Hey, Cindy. Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Good. I'm a little scared about being the expert, but that's okay. I know you are definitely the expert. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Horticulture, and I've worked in the horticulture department for over 20 years. So I do know a little something about gardening. And I teach several classes in horticulture. And Richard and I are the consumer horticulture extension specialist for the state. Yes, we have another special guest joining us later. Um, well, we are going to get going just for our viewers. You guys can ask any of your gardening questions, whether you're a beginner or you've been doing this for as long as Cindy has, um, throw those in the comments and we'll make sure to tackle those questions throughout. Uh, the way this kind of works is Cindy's going to share some of her uh, big tips and hints that will help some of our beginning gardeners. You guys ask your questions and at the end we'll hit the Q&A. Sounds great. ready? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. So we are going to talk about some tips from an expert, from one of the experts, and, and Richard will join us a little bit later. Um, we want to encourage more gardening and more novice gardeners to get into this um, because it is a little scary sometimes, but it can be a lot of fun too. So next slide. So first off, we have to think about five gardening, oh, the health benefits of uh, health and home benefits of gardening. Um, there's a lot of things that gardening can do for you. Um, growing your first vegetable garden can actually save you some money. So if there's a, a certain vegetable that you love and that you grow and eat a lot of, um, you can grow it at home. Some of these even in containers um, so that you don't have to purchase them at a grocery store or you're limiting um, the, your trips to the grocery store, which is a good thing uh, right now. Um, it also increases your access to fresh foods, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, because when you're growing your own, you're more likely to harvest and use them because you spent the time there. Um, and if you're growing it, you're more likely to try it and find ways to use it and preserve it um, so that it can be used later. Uh, we've also noticed that uh, gardening is a great way to engage kids um, in different science and math and engineering practices or STEM learning. So getting kids out to enjoy the garden and to use that natural curiosity really helps with learning, which has been pretty important this spring when uh, school kind of ended a little bit early. Gardening is great for mobility as well and flexibility. Um, all these gardening activities get you bending, get you stretching, get you moving. Um, and it's not a incredibly strenuous activity. It's considered kind of a moderate intensity um, activity, uh, which is perfect because that encourages more flexibility and movement. Um, and all of those are good things uh, in reducing risk of dementia, lowering stress, and being outside increases those vitamin D levels. Um, so even with sunscreen on, um, you're absorbing vitamin D that helps improve your mood. You're engaging with the outdoors and that helps lower your stress level or cortisol levels. Um, and then just that engagement and that problem solving that you have to do sometimes with gardening uh, reduces that risk of dementia. And then I like gardening because I get to spend some time with my husband and my son, though I'm not sure my 12 year old thinks of this as quality time when we're weeding the garden, but it's fun for all of us, at least a little bit. So next slide. 
So gardening's great, um, has a lot of benefits. It's important though, if this is your first garden to start small um, because it can be very overwhelming very quickly if you decide that you wanna grow everything. So think of a small garden, focus on the three or four vegetables that you wanna grow. Um, pick a location that's getting full sun, that has well-drained soils. If you don't have a plot of land, um, think about containers and think about the different types of soils that you would use in those containers, which are usually a potting mix uh, of some sort. You do need full sun for almost all vegetables. So that means six to eight hours of direct light a day. Um, and we usually insist on a good well-drained soils because vegetables don't like sitting in kind of soggy soils for any length of time. When you're considering vegetables, you also should consider their mature size. Radish stay really small, but a tomato can get over five feet tall. So make sure that you're thinking about that mature size and reading those labels and giving your vegetables plenty of room to mature and perform well for you. When you're taking a look at your garden soil, if you're concerned, um, maybe it doesn't drain well enough, think about adding things like compost, um, maybe even some peat moss um, to the soil to help improve uh, drainage. That's pretty important, especially on the first garden. You can also do a soil test. Um, it's not too late to get started um, and amending the vegetable garden soil is an okay idea because most vegetables, the roots stay within this kind of soil area. So you can amend um, and make your soil better so that these vegetables perform better. And then finally, when you're thinking about starting a vegetable garden, think about what you wanna grow and why you wanna grow it. So if you love tomatoes and making salsa, grow tomatoes, maybe some cilantro as well. Um, but if you hate tomatoes, don't grow it. So think about the things that you want to grow because those things that you want to grow and their characteristics and how well they will grow in your area, you wanna make sure you match those two um, so that you're spending the time harvesting, maintaining, and caring for something you're really gonna love. Next slide. So some of the easiest vegetables to grow are the ones that I usually recommend for novice gardeners. And these include tomatoes um, because everybody loves tomatoes. Um, with tomatoes, you have all different types of large ones, or small ones. Um, there are tomatoes for processing for sauces. Um, there are tomatoes that are better, like cherry tomatoes that are better on a salad. So tomatoes, you get a lot of diversity, um, a lot of opportunity to make some nice selections. And then um, they're fairly easy to grow as long as you water them regularly and you stake them so that you keep the fruit really off the ground um, that prevents any disease or damage to the fruit. Um, peppers are also pretty easy to grow. And with peppers, you also have a lot of selection too. Um, you can have sweet peppers like bell peppers, which are very easy to grow and used in a lot of different recipes. Or if you like it hot, there's some spicy peppers out there as well that work well. Um, in Iowa gardens. Peppers like it warm, just like tomatoes. These are warm season crops that are planted sometime in May, um, usually late May, and still can be planted now and still have something to harvest before the end of summer. With potatoes, you have a couple of options too. Um, Irish potatoes, it may be getting a little late to plant the regular potatoes. Um, it's not too late to plant sweet potatoes. So if you're thinking about starting a vegetable garden and want to start some sweet potatoes, you can do that. Potatoes are planted differently. Tomatoes and peppers are planted as transplants, but potatoes, regular potatoes or cut up pieces of potatoes are planted and sweet potatoes cuttings of the vines are actually planted. So both of these you can get from a garden center and they'll show you how you would plant those.
And then the last two of the easiest vegetables to grow are green beans and zucchini. Um, and I love green beans because they're sown from seed. This is something you probably grew um, in elementary school, believe it or not. And you just sow the seed about an inch deep, thin them to a few inches apart, and then stagger that sowing so that you plant one row one week and two weeks later you plant another row and two weeks later you plant another row so that when you're harvesting green beans you're harvesting throughout the summer um, even in through um, September into October. And zucchini is another one of those vegetables that's easy to grow. And once it gets started, it just keeps on giving. Um, so zucchini can be yellow or green like in the photo. Um, the plants get fairly big, so give them plenty of room. You plant the seed directly in the garden and plant a couple of extra zucchini plants in case something happens to one of them. And really all you need are a couple of zucchini plants. And you usually have plenty of zucchini uh, throughout the the summer. My one tip with growing zucchini is make sure you harvest them when they're small. Um, smaller zucchini is a lot easier to use. When they become baseball bat size, it becomes pretty seedy and pretty difficult to use. You have to go to zucchini bread uh, with that. So next slide. So as you're starting that vegetable garden, um, two of the biggest chores that you have are watering and weeding. And some of the uh, watering FAQs we get are how often do I water and generally we suggest that most vegetable gardens get an inch of rain or irrigation every week. So if it hasn't rained you need to water and with tomatoes you want to have that kind of consistent moisture so you might water twice a week um, and make sure that you're kind of that whole garden is getting about an inch. Um, that's that's ideal. Uh, what time of day? Generally the best time is in the morning. Um, the worst time to water is at night because the foliage stays wet longer overnight and that can create disease problems. So if you get up a little bit early in the morning, um, that's the best time to water uh, before you would head out to work or before you get started or right after breakfast. That's the time to water and check on things in the vegetable garden. And there are ways to reduce water in your vegetable garden. One of the easiest ways is to mulch things um, to kind of cover after the seed have kind of come up, after you've planted the transplants, uh, put a couple of inches of a mulch, an organic mulch on top. This helps conserve moisture so that when you're watering, um, it's going to the root system. This also helps prevent splashing, which can help prevent disease as well. Next slide. Weeding is the one chore everybody hates, or at least I hate it. Um, this is not my favorite thing to do, but it's pretty important in a, a vegetable garden because weeds compete for resources. So they'll compete um, with your vegetables for water and nutrients and light. They'll get big and kind of shade out your vegetables. So weeding frequently, which often means going out into your vegetable garden and removing those weeds every week for the first few weeks is pretty important. Um, that mulch that you put down will help um, prevent weeds from coming up. And when they do come up, it'll make it easier uh, to pull. So the more you can remove them, the better off you'll be. Eventually, some of your plants like tomatoes will get big enough that they'll shade out any weeds. They're kind of competing, but that's usually about a month in, a uh, month and a half in before you start to see those that you have to, you don't have to weed quite as much. Um, and preventing them does mean usually mulch. You can use some um, herbicides, but you have to be really careful in using herbicides in the vegetable garden because tomatoes and peppers and some of our really popular vegetables are super sensitive to a lot of different um, chemical herbicides. So hand pulling um, and weeding with the weeder or a hoe are probably the most common ways of removing weeds. Next slide. With gardening, there's a lot of myths as well. And Richard wrote this nice little article on five too good to be true myths um, that we should mention as well. And they start to pop up now. Um, usually after the garden has started. Um, they're 
often missed like Epsom salts or Tums can be added uh, to the garden. Um, Epsom salts adds magnesium. So it's like a fertilizer. Some people think it's like a fertilizer for the garden. And this works if your garden is deficient in magnesium. Um, it doesn't do much if it's not. You're kind of wasting um, Epsom salts. Um, Tums is supposed to work in the same way. Um, it provides calcium to your tomatoes and some tomatoes have problems with blossom in rot, which is a calcium deficiency, but your water generally has enough calcium. So just watering more frequently is all you have to do to overcome that um, blossom in rot. Um, it still doesn't stop the myth from being out there, um, but it's really not needed. Other myths that you might hear about are that gypsum improves a, the um, drainage or alleviates compaction in a clay soil. And that works in soils in the Western United States. It's not effective in Iowa. If you wanna alleviate compaction in your lawn, um, core aerate or till is probably uh, the best thing uh, to do, core aerate for your lawn. And then the others in, involve a couple of animals. Um, I had a grandmother that insisted that ants were required uh, to get peonies to open and bloom, and it's not. Um, ants do visit peonies when they're starting to bloom because they release a little bit of a nectar, a sweet sugar um, that they farm and take back uh, with them, but it's not required to get the peonies to bloom. And you're not attracting a ton of ants by having peonies either. And then moles, um, controlling moles with the insecticides uh, to prevent grubs in particular um, will, so if you, the myth is if you um, spray or use insecticides to eliminate the grubs, then you will also eliminate the moles um, in your lawn. And it sounds good, except for moles don't generally eat grubs. They eat earthworms and we don't have any insecticides and don't want any insecticides to control earthworms. So this is another one that uh, doesn't really do what it's supposed to. To do. So think about this. Um, you're now becoming the gardening expert in thinking about some of the myths and debunking some of these common myths in the garden. Next slide. So with that, in um, in gardening, we have a lot of these myths, so it's really important for us to make sure that we share research-based resources with everyone so that we can do that critical thinking, um, so that we can do the problem solving, um, because there are problems or issues sometimes with gardening. And so here's some resources that you can visit. Um, the Department of Horticulture homepage um, is one of them, talks a lot about and links to a lot of our extension programs as well. The Horton Home Pest News is another web page that both Richard and I contribute to regularly. Um, this gives you link to a lot of press releases that come out. Uh, the Horton Home Pest News is a, a bi-weekly newsletter that comes out during the gardening season from entomologists as well as horticulturists um, and plant pathologists. So we talk about the things that we see. Uh, Richard is the Hortline guy. Um, so he is the one who answers all these emails on gardening questions, and you'll hear from him in just a minute. Um, one of my new things to do is the Sow, Grow, Eat, and Keep series. Um, I'm working with uh, staff, extension staff in food science and human nutrition. So how to grow something is my part of it, and then they take on what to do with it, how to freeze it, how to make freezer jam or salsas, how to preserve that taste of summer afterwards. You can also visit the Extension store. We have over 200 publications on gardening topics alone, and almost all of the vegetable gardening and fruit gardening publications are free uh, for you to download. So you can find out more information on almost any gardening topic. And then finally, every county um, has 
or almost every county has an active Master Gardener program, and there are Master Gardeners scattered throughout the state. So you can ask them questions. You can also become a Master Gardener because we're training Master Gardeners this fall. So contact your local county extension office uh, to find out more about what Iowa Master Gardeners do and how they help educate others and answer gardening questions. So next slide. So now we're at the Q&A time. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, for being used to radio, you are certainly very good on the video, too. So now <laughs> we know. You. We can use you more. Thank um, you. Had fun. So <laughs> for our, any of you that are viewed, you'll notice in the comments um, that we've been adding links to a lot of the information that Cindy shared about, as well as all of those resources she just listed. We have links that you can click on to visit any of those pages. So you have access to those um, and those stay through as long as this uh, video lives on Facebook. Excellent. Um, so I, I wrote notes, Cindy, that was, Excellent. and at one point I went like this, I was like, oh, what did you say? <laughs> oh, watering at night because I knew like, well, I thought I knew you're not supposed to water during like the heat of the day, like right. at the peak, but it never dawned on me to not water at night because then it stays like wet all night. Well, most that was like, most people like to water at night because they get home yeah. from work and it's kind of a convenient time to do it. Yeah. But then that foliage stays wet and it becomes just a disease kind of I know. test tube experiment happening there. So yeah. yeah, watering in the middle of the day is usually not very efficient because it evaporates but and the plant doesn't get it. But, but watering yeah. at night can be really bad. Yeah, so. that was just like a, a <laughs> mind blown moment. So yay. Um, okay, Thanks. let's bring Richard on because okay. that's why we're all here. Hi, Richard. Hi. <laughs> so um, this is Richard Duran, our hort specialist and Cindy's uh, partner in crime. Um, and he is available every Friday on um, Iowa Public Radio for at 10 a.m. And are you you're there for an hour? Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah, and he they he'll bring specialists on, and you call in, and you ask questions, and you learn so much. All right, Richard, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, I'm an alumnus of Iowa State. I worked here for over 35 years in horticulture. Um, I think I've answered over 150,000 phone calls. At least, at, at least. least, yeah. <laughs> Uh, around oh 25,000 or more emails. Oh my gosh. So I've heard a lot. <laughs> I also do not like the term expert mm. oh. because I associate associate that with someone who is trying to sell something. Uh, they call oh. themselves experts when they're not. Mm. So I don't use that term. Okay. So we'll call you the aficionado. What? Uh, <laughs> the gardening <laughs> guru. There we go. I like that. A hoarder The hoarder Yes. Well, you're you're extremely experienced, and now you can add humble to your resume as well. And, is, and out of twenty five thousand emails, I think only five thousand came from me. So that's that's wonderful. It's it's hard to stump Richard. So that's well, the good, that's the good news. Now so. we have to see mm -hmm. if we can. Yes. All right. So I've kept track of some of the questions that have come in. Um, so let's get to those and then you guys can decide who will answer or maybe you'll both have a little bit to share. Um, we'll throw the questions up at the bottom so you can see them. So one question that came in was, what's the best way to know if you have given your garden an inch of water? Uh, I would go out probably with a screwdriver. And just go, you know, <laughs> poke it into the He's ground. He's not joking. No, no. See how far the water has gone. Right. Uh, okay. When you so water, like checking your oil. You basically want to have the water go down six, seven, eight inches or more into the soil. And if you're only moistening the upper two or three inches, you haven't done a good job. Right. And sometimes I will put a a bucket or a can or something out. So mm -hmm. when I'm sprinkling a garden and I will make sure that I've got, you know, about an inch in that, that particular cool whip container or whatever the case may be oh. to make sure that, okay, it's at least gotten that inch. Mm -hmm. So if you're like watering your garden, you put something that's in the middle of that area mm -hmm. so that you can, that's really, 
And that's that very practical. It is very practical. It's not really <laughs> complicated either. And then after, you know, after doing this once or twice, then you know that, okay, it takes about 30 minutes or it takes about an hour and I'm probably going to get enough water for this particular section. Right. Gotcha. So use your bucket or your can a couple times, mm -hmm. get an mm -hmm. idea of the length of time and then, and then, well, there and then I like the screwdriver trowel idea too, to check, to make sure it's getting to the root system as well. I'm going to write that down too, I guess. <laughs> All right. Our next one. Somebody's got some rascally rabbits that like to visit their mm -hmm. backyard. How do you keep them from your garden? Essentially, you basically use a fence. It's um, the only, the it's the only way. way. Doing it. Um, uh, there's hardware cloth fencing, there's chicken wire fencing. It needs to be at least a foot and a half foot tall so they can't get over it. Um, there are rabbit repellents mm -hmm. and they have this hideous smell or odor. Right. Um, they sometimes work, uh, sometimes not. They, they you often also work. have to reapply them after a rain. So yeah. Yeah. fencing is the most effective. Right. I also have a dog, um, a puppy that <laughs> likes to chase rabbits, but he does almost as much damage as the rabbits. So fencing is really your best Control. I was going to say the same. I have a toddler, so that's one there way to. Also, that's but true. they're much more expensive than a fence. Your, I think a fence <laughs> might be your best cost effective. Okay. Yeah. Um. So we are seeing a huge rise in raised beds, and one of the questions was there. This person was used to tilling um, an in-ground garden, but how are we doing that tilling in a raised bed? Uh, basically, with a shovel or spade, you just turn it over that way. So. It is a little bit more difficult possibly to do that versus a tiller, but you just simply uh, turn it over with a shovel or a spade. There, there are some really small tillers that you can purchase that might be suitable. You know, they're easy enough to pick up and put into a, a raised bed, but you know, your shovel, just tilling it up that way, you get more physical activity and usually it doesn't take that long. So, and it's a, it's a lot less expensive. All right. Um, Good questions. So I know they're uh, they're making me think. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what are some vegetable varieties suitable for containers? So, kind of that raised bed theme, but this one's a little more container garden. Well, as far as tomatoes, there are two different types. You have the determinate types and the indeterminate types. The determinate types only grow about three foot tall. So you want to plant a determinate type tomato. You can also put in peppers. Uh, you could possibly put in cucumbers, uh, summer squash. Uh, so a number of different things. The main thing as far as the containers is it has to have drainage holes in the bottom and it has to be sufficient as far as size wise for the actual plant. Yeah, and some of these labels for the different cultivars for tomatoes, it might say patio tomato, or it might say compact uh, zucchini or cucumber or more bush type um, snap bean, whatever the case may be. So we usually look for some things that are a little bit smaller and then a suitable size container. We're not planting vegetables in a teacup. We're planting them in, uh, yeah, I know, I know. It's a, so a five, cute though. I know it's cute, it's very <laughs> cute. Um, but uh, maybe a succulent in a teacup, that would be a little bit better. But think about vegetables, think about giving them plenty of root space so that you're only watering them, you know, every other day or two or three times a week um, instead of twice a day. So nice enough container with drainage and then a smaller, more compact habit if possible. Mm -hmm. It's always very interesting to me how many, um, plant containers you can buy without holes in the bottom. Like, I know, I know. Seems like those should come that way. But. It's a little bit scary. A lot of them you can add holes to them. Um, so some of them are plastic and you can just pound a nail even uh, to or make- Or Richard's it. screwdriver. Or screwdriver. Or screwdriver, absolutely. back in. Absolutely. Or yeah. a drill. Or a drill. Oh, yeah. That would be probably a better use for, uh, for a drill. Um, you have to be careful with some of them, though. Um, there are some ceramic containers that are hard. And in that instance, you might 
by another container that sits inside the ceramic container that drains. And then you've, you've kind of, um, the ceramic container holds the excess water that you can then dump out as needed. There you go. You can mm -hmm. have your pretty pot and keep your plants exactly. alive too. Exactly. All right. So another question was, do I need to rotate crops in a vegetable garden? Yes, you do. <laughs> and that's because um, uh, plants tend to be susceptible to specific things disease-wise. And over time, if you plant the same thing in the same location, it builds up in the soil and the disease becomes more and more severe. And so you want to rotate as best you can. Uh, for example, uh, most vegetables belong to a family. So you have the cold crops like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower. Then you have the nightshade family that where you have tomatoes, peppers, and potatoes. And so you want to rotate families. So where you have tomatoes this year, some other plant family, like the cold crops, or maybe beans or beets, but not another member of that family. So you wouldn't want to plant peppers after tomatoes. They belong mm -hmm. to the same family. This this gets really hard in a vegetable garden because tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and eggplant are all in the same family, and they shouldn't go in that quadrant for three or four years. And the same with broccoli and cauliflower and kale and Brussels sprouts and cabbage. So that quadrant, none of those can go in there. So you've, you know... That, that sets you up so that you're growing corn and beans or okra, uh, which is a totally different family on occasion to kind of keep that ro rotation going. I have some family that I also should not be in the same quadrant as, so that makes total sense. Like, perfect. Perfect I totally analogy there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, another question is, what is the best types of mulch for a vegetable garden? Uh, I think in a vegetable garden, you want something that achieves a purpose, but it also breaks down fairly quickly. Right. So you typically don't want to use wood chips. Mm -mm. Uh, what you'd want to use basically would be uh, dry grass clippings. They work great. Mm -hmm. uh, you could use shredded leaves. You could use straw. And typically by fall, a lot of that organic matter has broken down. And what you can do is actually till in what remains into the soil in the fall. I've even seen home gardeners that will put down um, shredded paper, newspaper, or sheets of newspaper down and then put grass clippings or shredded paper on top. Because the mulch you want to help conserve moisture, but it still allows the moisture through. And then it's blocking the light for any weed seeds that are trying to germinate. And a couple of inches or a layer of newspaper actually works pretty well. So it's a great way to recycle a lot of things in the garden too. Yeah, the grass clipping is a good one. And mm -hmm. I feel like something that my kids at the ages they're at could help with. So I think that's a good chore, a good thing to add to the to do. They're going to be very happy that I was able to get the, <laughs> these. <tips. laughs> All right, we're going to keep going. Let's say, see, so we've talked about rabbits, but what about squirrels oh. digging up pots and plants? How do what, any any tips on how to keep squirrels from digging up um, pots and plants? Uh, that is extremely difficult. Yeah. Uh, what you might want to do is maybe try to cut some some wire fencing mm -hmm. and maybe laid on the surface so they physically can't do it. Uh, or you could try maybe putting some rock on the surface. Yeah. Uh, pea gravel or something like that where it's difficult to dig, but it's mm -hmm. extremely difficult once they get in, in their mind that they want to <laughs> dig up this pot. Right. Sometimes just if it's in a container, just moving it to a location that's not as accessible um, as well. And I find that when squirrels are digging in my containers, they're digging to plant something like a walnut um, mm -hmm. or they're digging up something that they thought they planted and they do it once or twice. And then they're kind of, OK, no, I didn't. I didn't really do this here. So they move. <laughs> they move on, I hope. So but it is hard to 
discourage them. They're they're pretty persistent. And this it, could be uh, the tree squirrels, but also the chipmunks. And the oh, this squirrels. is true. Yeah. So. Yep. They're all cute. They're so, all cute, and they I get into everything. I know. I know. I know. It again goes straight back to the toddlers. I'm telling you, we are on. I think your advice is going to trans go for plants and parenting. I think this is a crossover. <laughs> I think we've got a lot of information here. All right. So now we've done rabbits, squirrels. Let's talk about bugs. Mm. Uh, how do you keep squash bugs off of zucchini plants? Um, that is difficult. Um, also, a few adults will overwinter. Mm -hmm. um, the females uh, will lay their eggs on the underside of the foliage. And you'll see these kind of brick red clusters. If you see those, you can squash them and destroy them that way. Mm -hmm. uh, once they hatch, you can use an insecticide. But the key is there to get them when they're small. Mm -hmm. Because once they become adults, they're almost it's indestructible hard. as far mm -hmm. as insecticides. So you have to check periodically, and you're going to find them clustered near the base of the plant, typically when they're young, and they're kind of whitish. They don't really look like the adult at all, but that's what they are, young ones. And get them when they're small, and that way you break the uh, cycle, and you don't get more later on. So Yeah, it's get a, them early. A, yeah, get them early, because they are a tough one. Um, you still tend to get zucchini or squash even if you have some squash bug damage um, but with them you also have some other things that can come in too so that might yeah at some point it becomes so destructive to the plant that it's starting to impact production mm. so and yeah. if i'm remembering right you said you could plant zucchini you really don't need a bunch of plants but plant some extras just in case Plant some extra because you might lose one or two to squash bugs or vine borer. But if you've got a couple of plants, you've probably got plenty of zucchini. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, it, if right. you don't, your neighbors will have them and share zucchini with you as well. That's true. That's mm -hmm. true. All right. Do you have any special care tips for eggplants? Boy, not really. Uh, just make sure they have plenty of sun. Um, the biggest problem might be flea beetles. Yeah. Uh, they'll attack the foliage, and you'll see these very minute little holes, like they've been maybe hit with a BB gun, as mm -hmm. far as all these little holes. Um, if the numbers are fairly small, don't worry okay. about it. The plants can deal with it. But if the actual leaves become riddled with holes, then you may have to control them. And control usually requires a spray, um, unfortunately. Um, but that helps protect, once again, the fruit as it's developing. There's a lot of fun eggplant out there, too. So they don't all have to be this purple kind of pear shape. There's some mm -hmm. longer ones, Asian-like ones, that are gorgeous. So I guess my special care tip would be to try something different in eggplant because there's a lot of cool ones out there. There's even one I like that's really small that's perfect mm -hmm. for the skewer for the barbecue. Or for oh, the yeah. grill. And I'm just craving eggplant parmesan now. So <laughs> I'm just hungry. <laughs> that sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. All right. So we had someone comment that they just planted a northern blueberry bush and they wanted to know if you had any advice on keeping it healthy. Well, blueberries are kind of uh, challenging for Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically need two things they need a well drained soil. If they're put in a poorly drained wet site, they'll get a root rot and they will die. Uh, they also need an acidic soil, which we do not have in Iowa. Uh, they need a pH of around five, four and a half or so. Our pH tends to be around seven, so it's much higher. And so one way to do that is when you plant these, uh, go ahead and mix the soil with some stagnant peat moss that is very, very acidic, and mix that together about half and half, half soil and half peat moss, and then backfill with that mix. And then every year go out maybe in the spring and sprinkle some sulfur around the plants. That, that will help kind of lower the pH a little bit as well and keep it kind of going uh, in that direction because it is all about pH for blueberries. They really do need 
that kind of low lower pH. And you know if you've not got an, the low enough pH because the foliage starts to look yellow and the veins will stay green. So that's your clue that it's time to try and lower that pH again um, with sulfur or some other kind of product to try and lower that pH. Uh, they also have a shallow root system and so they tend to dry out very quickly. So go ahead and mulch those with like wood chips mm -hmm. and during prolonged dry periods, maybe water them every 10 days or so. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna put up another question. Um, we had a specific one about some maples that have been planted by a nursery. They recommend 10 gallons of water a week. Um, it doesn't seem to be quite enough to ensure they're getting enough water during the heat. Any Any tips on that? Um, I typically don't recommend a certain amount per se, because if you go out there with a bucket and throw it on all at once, it runs off and doesn't soak in where you want it. Mm -hmm. So what I typically suggest is uh, just go out there and water. And when you do so, water slowly and deeply. You can use a bucket. You can use a hose. Um, and when you water, water the soil ball directly and the surrounding soil around that soil ball. And so if you're using a bucket, you know, slowly pour it around the plant or tree, let it soak in, maybe come back in 15 minutes, apply another bucket of water, and maybe do this over time where you put on maybe four or five, six buckets of water and let it mm -hmm. soak in. If you're using a hose, uh, I would just turn it on very slowly and maybe leave it at one spot for maybe 10 minutes. And then move it. move it. Move it to the opposite side. Let it run for 10 minutes. And go around the tree like a clock, like 12, 6, 3, 9. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this is when the screwdriver comes in handy again. It's so back. The screwdriver is back. <laughs> you can check to make sure that the water has gotten to where you want it. Um, and then, you know, maybe every you're doing this every week for three or four weeks to make sure that you've gotten that root ball. And then you're going to wean that tree a little bit off of that every week watering to maybe every 10 days to every two weeks. And you'll see that as the root system establishes, it won't maybe need quite as much. Um, or some some weeks it may be super dry and it actually needs more. So it's it's like that toddler again, taking care of it. Mm -hmm. And the weaning. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Richard, do you care if it is a Phillips or a flathead screwdriver or is, is it do either? Not care. Neither. Okay. So we heard do it here. Care. All right. We had another tree question. My magnolia tree doesn't mm -hmm. look like it's thriving, dying branches, sparse leaves. Any hope for recovery or should this viewer possibly look at replacing? Uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, the two things that I worry about, uh, sometimes if we have a harsh winter, mm -hmm. that may be responsible for the dieback. Um, can't do anything about that. And then the other thing that I would worry about or be concerned about is magnolia scale, right. which is an insect. It's a very large insect. Easy to see. And what you would see typically might be sticky sap on the lower leaves or the plants on the ground because they're sucking sap from the plant tissue and then excreting what they call honeydew, which falls on things below them. And that's typically what most people see first is the honeydew on plants or leaves below the actual tree. Uh, that's a very difficult insect to control, but if you don't control it, uh, the plants could de decline fairly quickly and actually die. So uh, check on that uh, to see if that's present. If it's a if it's a new magnolia, it may need some some extra watering during periods of drought this summer. I know my magnolia had a few issues this spring with a late frost, so that kind of killed some of the the flower buds and and damaged a little bit of the leaves as well. Um, so I'll make sure to water it um, during dry periods in the summer. But as it gets established, I wouldn't be too worried um, if it's not thriving. A few dead branches, not a big deal, depending on its size. But when it's losing, you know, a third or a half of the tree, then it's time to be concerned and maybe have someone come out and take a look at it. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we've got a follow-up question um, that you mentioned, grass clippings for mulch. Does that introduce weed seeds to get more weeds um, or the grass growing in your garden beds? Well, typically if you have, I would say a fairly decent lawn without too many weeds, that should not be an issue as far as the weed seeds. Um, sure, dandelions bloom in the spring, but that's the only time they bloom. Um, so that, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and so you're not introducing roots or plant parts, just the foliage. So that really shouldn't be a major problem. All right. Let's see. We had a question come in. Um, what are the best flowers to plant to repel deer or other and or other pests? I don't think there really is. <laughs> no uh, magic here. Not, unfortunately not. <laughs> People try miracles and other plants. Uh, but in reality, uh, they just bypass those, the things they don't like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And zero in on those things that they do. The um, there are some plants that, that they tend to ignore. Mm -hmm. And then some plants they love. But if they're hungry, they'll basically eat almost anything. So right. there's nothing deer proof. No, but they do tend to ignore those things that are very smelly, like herbs. They don't like marigolds as much. Um, they don't like things that are super fuzzy as well, because apparently they're not real tasty. Um, but if they're really hungry and they don't have another food source, they'll even go after those. And even plants that we would consider poisonous, um, too. So it's a tough one. So, yeah. Yeah. No good answer on that one. Mm -mm. Um, all right. Where could where can someone get a soil test? Um, is there a cost? What what information if somebody's like, maybe I need my soil tested? Well, Iowa State no longer does soil testing, mm -hmm. but our neighboring states do. So the University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, they would do so. And you can actually do a soil test specifically for a lawn or garden. Uh, yeah. There are private laboratories that do that in Iowa and throughout the country, but oftentimes they're more geared to the agronomic customer, the farmer, and not the gardener. Right. I think it's important you tell them that this is for a vegetable garden or this is mm -hmm. for your flower garden, because those recommendations then are based on what you're trying to do and not for corn or soybean field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We've got uh, some black-eyed Susans that have lower leaves with black mm -hmm. spots and holes. Mm -hmm. What is it? Let's see if we can okay, step Cindy. through. Okay, now, now I get it. See, I Ooh. get the hard ones. I get the hard ones. <laughs> there, there are some um, anthracnose and some uh, disease issues with black-eyed Susan, and that might be causing the black spots. My guess is um, this tends to be more of a problem with black eyed Susans that are in some shade, um, that the foliage may be getting wet. Maybe they're watering it at night. This would be one of those instances where this actually might appear. That's usually what I'm thinking about, uh, for the black spots, the holes. I'm not real sure. Um, maybe, it depends on the holes. I mean, there are leaf cutter bees. There are a few other things that, that might cause holes, but you need to know if the holes are associated with the black spot. So it's a black spot or necrosis first, and then it just dies and creates a hole, or if there's something else coming like an insect. So black eyed Susans are generally pretty tough and can tolerate a little bit of this, a little bit of disease, even a little bit of holes from like a leaf cutter bee or something like that. So I wouldn't worry too much. It would just be a, a kind of a hint in my head that would say, okay, this fall or next spring, I might divide these black eyed Susans so I can give them a little more space in between plants so that they can get a little more air circulation and a little more light so that maybe I don't have this problem in the future. How did I do, right. Richard? Good, good. Okay, good. I mean, if I were grading, that was A plus for sure. <laughs> All right, another question that just came in. Um, we're experiencing some peas that are wilting. Anything, any way to lengthen their season? 
Mm. Boy, no, because they're a cool season crop uh, right. and they just don't do well in summer. So you have to get them in early, typically in Iowa around early to mid-April so that they mature before the heat of summer. Mm. And right. once we get into like mid to late May, it's too late to plant. Uh, you could try maybe a late summer crop. I mean, summer late summer planting for a fall crop. That sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. But you and could that, plant in late summer. And that late, and that late summer, summer means you're, you're, you're planting in early August, the seed again, or mid-August, so that you're harvesting in September and October. Right, right. Richard? Right. Okay. So. And they germinate right. really quickly then, too, so. Okay. Uh, what's the best way to prevent powdery mildew from mm. cucumber plants? Gosh, these are good questions. These are tough. I know. Mm -hmm. Boy, that is, that is difficult to do. Mm -hmm. um, make sure they have full sun again. That helps. Uh, there are some varieties or cultivars that may have some resistance, and that would be the best approach. Otherwise, you have to use a fungicide at the very first sign of symptoms. So if, I would try to find a variety that has some mildew resistance. And, and if you find one or two leaves that have powdery mildew, you can remove those leaves before they spread to others. But know that that's probably only going to buy you a little time. Um, and it's probably not going to totally correct the problem. And once again, this usually doesn't kill the plant. You usually still get some cucumbers, um, but maybe not as much as you would have if you didn't have powdery mildew. All right, we had another question. Best plants for a shady patio? Hmm. Are we talking there vegetables? Are, or yeah, there other? are many, 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 many plants that we can grow. I um, happen to know this person also has a cat, so it can't be something a cat would want to okay. nibble on. Okay. Well, as far as color, uh, you can't beat in patients. Right. They're an annual plant, mm -hmm. and they will bloom from spring until frost, that killing freeze. But as far as perennial-wise, you have so many plants. Hostas right. come to mind. They're very, very common. There are many, many varieties that are easy to grow. Uh, but you also have native uh, wildflowers, woodland plants that do well in the shade, like wild ginger, woodland phlox, bloodroot, mm -hmm. Solomon seal. So you can plant native plants. You can plant some non-native plants. You can plant some annuals. Right. Most of the um, annuals that I'm thinking for containers on a patio are like impatiens, maybe coleus. And they can probably take a little bit of that cat nibbling and be okay. Um, that's good. This is not a place where we're going to have any vegetables. So that would be the one thing to, to mention that, you know, if it's too shady, vegetables aren't going to do well. So you're going to go to the more ornamental side of horticulture, um, which which will be fine for the cat and Jordan. <laughs> okay. Um, we had a question. How are we preventing? And I'm not Rose. Rosette? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Rose. Rosette. How, are we, how are we preventing it? Maybe we should start with what is it? Because I don't know. Well, then, it's, it's a disease that basically attacks both wild and cultivated roses. Right. And there really is no treatment per se. No, it's a removal um, of the plant. If, if, you, if you see something that has where the uh, foliage, the growth is very abnormal, typically kind of reddish in color, kind of reddish purple, mm -hmm. the leaves are malformed. If you see that, then I would tend to suspect it is rose rosette. And the actual disease is spread by tiny little mites or insects. And so what you'd want to do typically is you, if you have a plant that's doing that, is to dig it up and destroy it. Yeah, not a there good answer. No, there is no effective treatment no. once I have it. Mm -hmm. That escalated quickly. <laughs> Very quickly. And it's like oh, I said, man. not a good outcome. So Oh, shoot. And I think that's the same thing that we've recommended for a decade uh, with this one. So I don't think our um, recommendations have changed because we don't have any good controls. Yeah. 
All right. Um, she's keeping her plants in a gr small greenhouse, uh, wondering when is it too hot, even if there's high humidity, high humidity. It's probably almost getting too hot now. When we have 90 degree days or 80 and 90 degree days, um, even a greenhouse that has some vents and some fans, it's probably getting over 100 um, in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And that may be too hot uh, for some plants. Um, so I would say having a thermometer inside the greenhouse might be helpful. Um, I know my parents have a small greenhouse in Louisiana, and when it's hitting 90 degrees outside, it's 120 in the greenhouse, Ooh. even with the, the vents open and fans going. It's just that greenhouse effect. So mm -hmm. there are no plants in their greenhouse. So, Richard? Uh, That's yeah, basically it. Yeah, I mean, if it gets too hot, you just you move them outside or do something else with them. Maybe a shady location outside mm -hmm. or um, even outside in a sunny location is going to be cooler than inside that greenhouse. All right. Um, I'm adding in my own question. Oh. <laughs> What's it going to be? <laughs> Best oh. gardening accessories. So I have a really good sun hat that I'm positive is exactly what I need to be an uh, not an expert, but a guru gardener. Excellent. Um, but <laughs> I, I corrected myself. What um, What are some things if I'm new to the gardening game? You know, you, there's so many things when you go down that gardening aisle that it gets a little overwhelming. So what are some some things that you've experienced that you think this is a good place to put your money? Uh, gloves. Mm -hmm. some nice gloves. I like the waterproof um, ones. You know, okay. they're kind of waterproof on one side. So uh, they last a, a little while. Mm -hmm. A hoe. Some sort of weeder okay. of some sort. Yep. Um, when you get older like me, you want some type of kneeling pad. <laughs> this is true. That's, that, that helps for anyone. Um, buckets. Uh, a tarp. Hmm. I hadn't thought about a tarp. Yeah. I have a um, wheelbarrow. Guys, so To drag things around as far as on a tarp. You can just drag them right. around. Right. And then a hat is always a good idea, too. Um, like you said, having that hat and gloves. Um, sometimes we have a soil knife. You have a soil mm -hmm. knife that you like, Richard. Right. So, um, so it's like a trowel, but it's super sharp and can go very deep um, or deep as in six to eight inches very quickly. So mm -hmm. and you can actually cut things with it, like mm -hmm. plant roots or tree roots. If you come into mm -hmm. small roots, you can actually cut it with it. So. It's a very useful tool. So it's it's a good idea to invest in a couple of really good tools, um, like a trowel or a knife and a shovel, and then some sort of weeder or hoe so that you can kind of get rid of, of those weeds. Because it's impossible sometimes to get them out just by hand. So. And if you buy good quality tools, they'll last forever. This cheap ones will break. This very is true. So. I, I buy I buy cheap gloves because I know I'm going to buy new gloves every year. Um, but that's the only mm -hmm. time I'm, I'm really cheap in my gardening accessories. Mm -hmm. A good hat, good tools that last you a while. Mm -hmm. I can get behind the hat. <laughs> um, okay. We, let's see. And again, I'm oh. not going to, I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right. How do you control purslane? Purslane? Purslane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Purslane okay. is an annual plant. <laughs> And it grows very quickly in the heat of the summer, and it spreads out. Um, it's kind of a succulent leaf, too. It is, a succulent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the flowers are, are typically very small and not very noticeable, mm -hmm. but they are very prolific seed producers. So the key with them is to control them when they're small. Do not let them go to seed. Mm -hmm. And if you just go out there with a hole, and leave them on the ground, they will sometimes reroot. Mm -hmm. oh. so it's kind of important to turn them upside down or actually physically remove them so they don't have that chance. Right. But the take key is take to them out. When they're small. Right. And they are edible, hence the we do not want to eat it. They they <laughs> are edible. Um, you can't eat them. They don't want to. I don't, I don't think they're very tasty, even in salads. So getting mm. them out of the garden and getting them out frequently in the garden. So doing that weeding a lot um, is important. And then persistence is key. Mm. So with All any right, weed, well, persistence is key. 
again, same with toddlers. It goes straight back to every time. This is true. Um, we've got a couple more questions. We'll answer those. And then I think chances are there'll still be more, but we're hitting an hour here. So we'll answer a couple more and then we'll sign off. And any other questions that come in after that point, we'll make sure to comment back and answer. So awesome. All right. So we'll do a couple more. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, is it too late to start strawberry seedlings? Have they're having trouble finding strawberry plants? Well, it's hard to grow strawberries from seeds. Uh, right. Typically, we plant plants, mm -hmm. and we'd like to plant those in April, early May. So right now, you're not going to find them. They're just not really available, and they're difficult to to plant at this point. So I think I'd plan for next year. Uh, maybe get the site ready for next spring. Right. Uh, you can do that yet this year. Uh, basically, strawberries need a well-drained soil. That's a requirement. They need that and plenty of sun. And so work up the soil, get rid of the weeds, and then be ready for next spring. Yeah, I think I would also see if there's any mail order that has anything available. They're going to be plants. They're going to be potted. And when you find them, they're probably going to be pretty big and maybe expensive. So you might decide very quickly that this will be too expensive starting now because those bare root plants will be available in April um, next year. So, yeah, it's a it's an easy one to do from plants or from bare root plants. But timing is just almost a little too late. Mm -hmm. All right. And we'll finish off with this question. Um, should we be tilling gardens each year? There's some controversial information mm -hmm. about tilling. Um, it's difficult to know the best approach. So what are you guys' thoughts? Uh, I like to. Um, one is that as you work in the garden, as far as uh, maybe harvesting something or whatever, you're compacting the soil. And so by the end of summer, the ground may be really hard in certain locations. The other thing would be if, for example, you want to work in some organic matter, mm -hmm. then you could apply that in the fall, till it in, and the soil should be ready for next spring. Yeah, the, with many vegetable gardens, um, tilling is beneficial because you kind of get on top of a lot of weeds and, and disease issues become less of a problem. But I do have some friends that don't till every year. They till maybe every two or three years. Um, and they, they work really hard at incorporating as much of that organic matter as they can when they're going to till. And then they work really hard and making sure um, they're careful in planting so um, and and weeding and, and controlling things um, so that, you know, maybe they can skip um, a year. Yeah. I think we don't have as many erosion issues in a vegetable garden, especially if we have, you know, raised beds or smaller vegetable gardens um, and we're using mulch to kind of prevent some of that soil loss as we might see in kind of an agronomic field. But we do typically till more maybe than we should. And if you want to try not tilling for a year, you might be have some other issues, um, but it's certainly possible. I think the vegetables will probably still be productive. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to throw um, a slide up there with contact information for Cindy and Richard as well as uh, places that you can find us like uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, these are great ways to stay in touch. Uh, make sure you're getting up-to-date information that is research-based. And again, uh, take a moment to jot down Cindy and Richard's emails. They are, just as you have gotten to witness, they are just phenomenal and um, have a great amount of information. And even if they don't know, they get to find it out. That's what I love is we get to learn. I know we didn't stump them yet. Today we had we had one or two questions that Richard did divert to Cindy. So I will say there was a chance. Um, but yeah, we're gonna leave that slide up here for a moment. Um, we're seeing some comments coming in. Uh, just thanking you guys, Richard and Cindy, for visiting with us today and sharing your know-how. Um, again, if there's any questions coming in in the comments or that come in later, we'll make sure that they see those so that they can answer for you. Uh, we value your guys' passion and the way that you serve others with the things that you love to do. 
Um, well, thank you guys. We had some really good conversation, a lot of people viewing, and um, I think we'll have even more that get to uh, see this video later on. So send Richard and Cindy all your questions. We're going to see if we can stump <laughs> Richard. And yes. remember, <laughs> remember all those tips. And I think I'm going to go look for a new screwdriver. Um, that's Just on my for list. The garden. I know Just that's on my list garden. now. It my doesn't have, to be, doesn't have to be new. It can be an old. Oh, one. okay, an old, a used. Any, if anybody's <laughs> selling a used screwdriver, please. Okay, well, thank you guys again, Cindy and Richard. I had a great time, learned thank a lot, you. and yeah, look forward to others enjoying this opportunity as well. Um, comment any of those questions. We'll make sure to send them on to Richard and Cindy and get them answered. And we look forward to seeing you guys again for another um, live video tips from an expert. Have a good day, all. Thank you. Bye.